166th contact. Thursday, March 11, 1982, 4 11 am. Quetzal says it is now that time. Billy says I couldn't sleep anyway, so let's go and see this funny planetary alignment at once. Quetzal says as you wish. Billy says aha there, the sun is already rising terrifically fast. Where do we actually have to go, in order to be able to see all the planets together? Quetzal says if you are standing on the earth and have the sun centered in front of you and then see this as left and right then we must keep to the left and, in addition, fly out into space a great distance. Only from there is it possible that all the planets in the alignment can be seen together. Billy says I know that, yes, I just didn't know where that point is. Quetzal says Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are the closest together, at least visibly, because they are truly separated by millions of kilometers. Billy says you mean hundreds of millions of kilometers. Quetzal says that is of correctness, and here we are already, my friend. You can make your observations from here. Billy says thank you aha interesting, but one can't really see everything by one's eyes. Even from here in free space the planets are too small. Quetzal says here, we are even further away from the planets than if you were to observe them from the earth. You can see them better if you observe them through this magnification device. Here. Billy says fantastic. This is probably a completely new device. Quetzal says yes, and it reflects the image recordings three-dimensionally. Billy says I can see that this is the most perfect 3D image that I've ever seen with you. Quetzal says here, do you see now? Billy says that is really incredible, the entire alignment has moved out of space and into the foreground. Now, I can fully recognize every single planet. Quetzal says if you glide one finger away and over this scale, then you can enlarge or shrink the image, depending on how you please. On this opposite contact line, however, with a simple touch of the finger, you can separate out any square as a cutout, which you can then also enlarge again with the scale, by what means it is possible for you to separate out individual planets and observe them individually. Billy says and can one enlarge the image of the planet onto the whole image area? Quetzal says certainly, test the device. Billy says I'm doing that wait man ah, here now. Man that is clever. Aha, now I have the earth, I get it now. Fantastic. It is bigger than on the biggest television screen of our house televisions but what is that? Man, ah, those are satellites whizzing there around the Earth in a variety of courses and far out into space. There are hundreds of them. The human beings of the Earth are so crazy to have placed the whole junk ring around the planet with these things. I've never seen this before. Quetzal says even for us, it wasn't possible before, this new device first offers us this possibility. But look here. Billy says Saturn, and there's Pluto, yes and there comes Uranus but, ah, I understand, this must be one of the Voyager probes. Is it also possible to fetch this and enlarge it? Quetzal says one moment, my friend here, you see? Billy says fantastic. It fills up half the screen, but man, how it looks. The thing is really scratched. Quetzal says the cosmic radiations and the frictions with dust particles, particularly from Jupiter's and Saturn's rings, haven't passed by the probe without a trace. Billy says oh, I see, that's why. Is the thing still functioning, then? Quetzal says the inner parts of the probe have only taken minor damages from the radiations. Nevertheless, the damages don't affect its function. It will still work perfectly for a long time. Billy says then our scientists still have to expect a lot of work. Quetzal says that will be the case, if nothing unexpected happens. But now, observe the whole alignment once more because we have to go back again. Billy says alright, I've done that already, but tell me, you explained to me that about every 180 years, 
all these planets are united on one side of the sun. But now, everywhere with us, it is maintained that this is only the case every 510 years. Moreover, it is also maintained that yesterday was the day when the planets would have stood in closest formation to each other, whereas you've explained to me that this wouldn't be the case until the 14th. Quetzal says my data are of correctness, which you can recalculate yourself. The Sol planets are on one side of the Sun approximately every 180 years, but it should be taken into account that they, in each case with these groupings, are spread throughout the whole space on the side of the Sun, while here, now, that grouping occurs, which really only repeats itself approximately every 500 years, namely when the planets move in only about a quarter of the space enclosing the Sun. If, now, the scientists of the Earth claimed that on Wednesday, the distance of the planets to each other was the lowest, then this information doesn't correspond to the truth because this only concerns an apparently nearest or closest distance. This apparent distance only arises from the viewing perspective of the Earth because seen from there, all the planets are the closest to each other according to sight. Nevertheless, the effective closest distance of all the planets to each other won't be reached until the 14th of March, for then, they will actually be the closest to each other according to distance. The Earth scientists are still mistaken in very many things, so also in astronomy. This will already prove itself again in a short time, when once again, the Earth scientists gain new insights in reference to new and revolutionary discoveries in space, so also in reference to the Sun and all Sol planets, but also in reference to the reality of the Earth's orbit around the Sun, which, in part, runs a little differently than what the scientists accept up to now. Hence, they will recognize and have to admit that also in reference to the four seasons, the revolution of the Earth around the Sun behaves a little differently than what has been taught. This will be a shocking realization, as well as the realization and finding that will be made in about 15 years, that the determined distances to the stars and galaxies, etc. are not correct. Billy says they are, indeed, used to the fact that they have to admit their crap again in each case even if this is often very difficult for them. Quetzal says that is of correctness, but now, we have to go back, my friend. In addition, I still have a few important issues to explain to you. Billy says then we can still rush around a bit in the storm that's raging over the Atlantic and over some parts of Europe. It was substantially crashing all around in the area when you brought me up into the ship. It sounded as if the entire center would be carried away by the storm. Quetzal says the elements really exert tremendous forces. In the current storm wind speeds of 127 km per hour are prevailing. Billy says tremendous, but I like such storms. Quetzal says as for your center, it is located in an offshoot of a hurricane. Billy says of course, I know that already, but a storm is a storm and even a hurricane is a storm for me and I just like storms. Quetzal says it corresponds to your nature, and somehow, you are just like that. Billy says you mean that like and like attract like? Quetzal says in this form, I have thought, yes. You have some of this natural stormy power in you, and I often had the impression, when you suddenly appeared in my ship, as if a piece of wilderness had appeared and had come to me. Billy says that sounds so damn suspiciously like earlier times, my friend, because one would often tell me this when I had come from somewhere in the desert, from mountains, or from the jungles and entered somewhere into a consulate or embassy or somewhere else into so-called civilized buildings, etc. Quetzal says that is known to me, but I had nothing to do with that, and my present words also don't refer to that but solely to my impression and uh, my feelings that really, sometimes, a piece of wilderness suddenly falls upon me when you appear. But it is always a piece of wilderness that is familiar and that offers security as well as strength, and before which one mustn't be afraid, if one is well-meaning toward it. Billy says you are dreaming, my son. 
Quetzal says nevertheless, the aforesaid corresponds to the facts. Billy says then so it is, where are we now? The storm is raging there below. Quetzal says high above the center. Billy says very nice below are the bubbling and scudding clouds and high above us is the star-covered sky. Quetzal says everything has its charms. Billy says you telling me, the world and the whole universe are simply fantastic, and it is worthwhile to live and enjoy every second. Quetzal says that is a word that the earth human beings should remember. Billy says you're asking for a lot there, just as if you'd require that the human beings of earth should stop their population explosion. Even lust, greed, obsession and irrationality are too greatly and deeply rooted in human beings for words of reason to be able to resolve this. That's why the problems also don't become smaller, even though new solutions are always sought and found, whether it concerns the area of rising crime the threat of war and the wars and revolutions, or whether it concerns famine, the energy problem, diseases, and so on and so forth. If all of us would think logically and rationally about all this, then we would all know damn well that none of these problems of the earth human beings can be satisfactorily resolved or corrected because all solutions are only self-deceptive solutions, for every solution to a problem only solves it momentarily for a period of several months at the most. Thus all solutions toward resolving the problems are only apparent solutions that represent a catastrophic self-deception, for in truth, the problems don't become solved at all. Any self-deceptive solution of the human beings of Earth, namely whether it concerns the construction of a new nuclear power plant or the new surveying of oil sources or grain productions, etc., only leads to the fact that earthly humanity always continues to rise sharply by what means the solution becomes self-deception, for through this, the apparently solved problem inflates to a new farce. Thus if the human being of earth truly wants to solve his already catastrophically degenerated problems of hunger, energy shortage, illnesses, criminal activity, and wars and revolutions, etc., then for this, there is only one way which exhibits no mercy namely an absolute, legally arranged birth stop across the whole world. At the same time, this birth stop would have to be controlled in such a way that for the preservation of humanity and new blood, a certain number of descendants may only be generated every seven years, and then again, seven years of the birth stop would have to be the rule. This would then have to be carried out until Earth humanity would be reduced to an acceptable and natural measure through the naturally occurring deaths of the excess population. There is simply no other way to solve the problem because every other way violates the natural laws and, therefore, represents a selfie deception. Quetzal says of clearer correctness, you could not have explained these matters. Indeed, all problems of the earth human beings can only be solved in this way. Obviously, you have made profound thoughts about this through which you've encountered the seven-year cycle, as we have also acquired this as a true solution, and even the High Council and Arahat Athasatha have only found this advice for the Earth human beings as the true solution to the problem. This subject, however, leads me into what I still wanted to discuss with you further and which assigns a new task to you. This concerns. Sentences 52 to 65 purely non-public, in a group, and private matters. Billy says that is, once again, a task that is appropriate for me. Damn it again. Quetzal says it is very unpleasant, I know, also the fact that in reference to group interests and other internal matters, a voice to the outside has existed for a while, through which very many things have been taken outside and have reached ears, for which, in fact, everything wasn't determined. But unfortunately, it happens over and over again, as I already mentioned recently, that new group members continuously give occasion for reproach because from the very beginning of the entrance into the group, they do not adapt themselves into the given regulations and ordinal rules. But this should, in fact, finally be so far that these kinds of incidents no longer appear. Billy says that would also be a relief for me. 
Quetzal says henceforth, it will have to be such that in cases of new admissions of group members, I have to give my consent for these, only after I have clarified some important facts about the persons concerned. Billy says that is right to me, for through this, I hope that a lot will improve. That is, if you actually rummage around a little in the brains of the persons concerned. Quetzal says from now on, that will be inevitable. But now, it is again the time that we part. Till we meet again. Billy says by now, I will still get some sleep. Bye. The End